You're listening to In The Zone, a podcast from the Middle East Treaty Organization, METO, about efforts to ban weapons of mass destruction from the region. I'm your co-host, Paul. And I'm Sharon, stepping in for Anahita. People often seem to think it's impossible to eradicate WMDs, but they are mistaken. It is a matter of political will. Today, we're talking with an old friend and colleague, Ambassador Wael Al-Assad. Few people have spent as long and put so much effort into this issue over the decades than Wael. Currently, he is Senior Advisor to the Qatari National Committee for the Prohibition of Weapons and a Senior Fellow on the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research Middle East Weapons of Mass Destruction Free Zone Project. But back in 2002, Wael established the Arab League's Department of Disarmament and Arms Control and coordinated Arab positions in this area for 18 years. He sat in public and private meetings at the highest level on behalf of the Arab world. And today he sits with us to discuss the key issues. It's really good to have you, Wael. Um, since I started uh, in disarmament and I was a toddler, you were already a veteran of disarmament. What was the passion that kept you going throughout these years? Thank you very much, Paul and Sharon, for inviting me to, to speak uh, uh, with you on this uh, issue that I've, I have spent many years working on with a lot of optimism sometimes and with a lot of pessimism also uh, sometimes uh, due to the uh, very awkward nature of this issue in the Middle East. The passion came actually very early in my life. In uh, 1974, when the issue was raised uh, in the General Assembly of the UN, I was only uh, one year out of college and a very uh, green uh, diplomat. But I looked at the idea and I found it fantastic. It solves so many issues if we implement such a zone in the region. Maybe it was a bit naive of me at the time, or a lot naive, because the problems were sometimes insurmountable, but it ignited uh, the passion you're talking about, Sharon, in me. And I kept following the issue. I wasn't really involved in it until the early 90s, where things uh, developed in the acres and then in uh, the 1995 MPT uh, review conference and uh, it, it formulated a sort of legal literature for us to work with. This passion continued with me in spite of the many disappointments that we saw through. But it is a very uh, logical and clear idea that makes sense for a region like the Middle East. And yet, there are so many obstacles to it. But the logic is there. To me, this idea was uh, very logical because it presented to us in the region a platform where all the countries of the region can come together and work at the same level, a level playing field, where we can solve and resolve our issues when it comes to arms control and, and regional security. And if we were serious, and when I say we, I mean the countries in the region, were serious about the issue, it is doable. So the problems does not arise from inability to implement the idea or that it is not logical, but arises from other external political tendencies uh, that sabotage uh, the whole issue. While there have been so many crucial moments in the history of the zone that you've witnessed and been a part of, when have you been most optimistic in that history? And uh, what do you think could have made the difference and taken us over a line that would actually have meant that we would have had progress? There has been a couple of instances where I thought it is very possible to move forward. I'm not saying to achieve the end goal, mm. but to seriously uh, move forward. Of course, the time of the Acres and the 1995 review conference, everybody was optimistic because of the peace process between the Arabs and, uh, and Israel. 
and uh, they thought that it could uh, move forward. But in 1994, the acres fell apart and the resolution of the 1995, the Middle East resolution in the uh, review conference was taken without the presence of Israel there. And that was a way out of Israel not to commit to, to, to this issue. The second instance where I felt it is possible was between 2012 and, and the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, when we engaged the Arabs, the Arab states, Israel and Iran uh, in sort of a preparation uh, mode, trying to consult together to reach uh, some sort of a formula to start uh, serious negotiations on the zone through a conference. And we had these meetings in Geneva and Lyon. The, the, the discussions were serious, some of it, some of it at least. And we touched upon issues that we never touched before. And it also gave us an idea of what the other is thinking of, what the Israelis are thinking of. They also got an idea of what we think of. There are so many misconceptions and distrust between the parties because there is no transparency in what we're saying at the political level, at the international level. And uh, some of these uh, uh, ideas were cleared during these meetings in Lyon and, and in Geneva. Unfortunately, we ended up hitting the same wall uh, that we kept hitting in the 90s and uh, now at, at, at this stage which is that certain parties do not see the point in giving up certain uh, privileges when it comes to arms control without surrendering their uh, power for a regional uh, idea. So that's basically it. It's, it's the same wall that we always uh, hit at the end of a very productive discussion. While uh, talking about certain parties that wouldn't give up their privileges, Tomorrow, there are elections in Israel, and maybe, not for sure, we have a new government in Israel. You have lots of experience talking to the Israelis. If you were to advise the Israelis on the November conference process, on the zone process, what would you say to the new Israeli government? What would be your advice to the new Israeli government? Uh, I'm not sure I would venture into advising the Israeli government on, on anything, <laughs> but from my experience, and this I have told some of my uh, Israeli counterparts, when it comes to the Israelis and also the Iranians, and they never liked what I said about this, is that they need to get out of their besieged mentality. They have a besieged mentality. And in, within this besieged mentality, they see threats and they miss opportunities. And I try to tell them that this is a major opportunity because it will open doors to other things. It will uh, immediately bring them a recognition, political recognition by all the parties in, in the region. It will open doors for cooperation. It will open discussions on regional security. This is the window from which they can enter the region. Unfortunately, they did not see it that way. And I said all these things to them. I gave them a complete picture on what it entails. What does it mean to sign a treaty with the rest of the Arabs and the Iranians on the zone, yet uh, that was a response to a question that came from the Israelis, which is, what's in it for us to join the treaty? Of course, there are the, the obvious uh, reasons why you should join a treaty for non-proliferation and, and arms control or a zone in the region, but also specific opportunities for the Israelis to enter the region. Yet they thought, and I think for the time being, they are right. They can get whatever they want from the region without paying anything. For, for the time being. But things change. Uh, uh, nothing remains as is. And there will come a time when they would need more. And I still believe that the idea of the zone will remain valid. It had remained alive more than 45 years now because we could not find a better alternative to it. We need to think of that. Yes, it was never, it never materialized 
but at the same time it was kept alive because we haven't found a better alternative to work arms control and regional security issues in the region. While it seems that uh, Iran and Israel, or especially in Israel, are quite obsessed with each other, capabilities or uh, opportunities or possibility to get nuclear weapons, uh, there are other states in the region that might get uh, nuclear capabilities. Would you advise both Israel and Iran to look at, this, at those states too when they're thinking whether to move forward with the zone? Well, the position of the Iranians, I think, is different than the position of the Israelis. The Iranians, I think it is quite clear from what I heard from them, that what they aim at is to have the capability, but not the weapon, to be something like uh, Japan and, and some of these states that have the technology, but they don't venture into uh, developing the weapon itself. If it is done within the uh, uh, international uh, rules and regulations and treaties, nobody can tell them no. But the idea itself is that the Israelis approach this issue from a position of trying to monopolize nuclear uh, weapons in the region, which is the wrong approach. We need to work together on clearing the region from these weapons, not to have one country monopolizing it. Other states now are saying, well, if the Israelis have it and the Iranians are seeking it, why not us as well? We, we cannot accept this imbalance in the power structure of the region. It is still talk. I mean, if, if, if the Saudis say that or another country say that, it's out of frustration more than a design and an intent. Of course, this kind of reactions, angry reactions because of the current situation is taken out of context and is put in the frame of, look, the Saudis are going to have nuclear weapons. You don't buy nuclear weapons from supermarkets. That's a very problematic issue, but it is a way of expressing their frustration with the current situation more or less. The Israelis have to realize, and the Iranians as well, that this frustration will hinder their ability to be part of this region and to really work together, not only on arms control, but on other issues as well. Well, I think you've really hit the nail on the head there with that word frustration. Uh, I mean, in the middle of pandemic everybody feels frustrated but yes <laughs> i mean you, but you you uh, must have been carrying so much frustration over the years uh, banging your head against this brick wall and i i wonder um when you look back on the tactics that the arab league uh, used over the years and they evolved and adapted and and attempted to achieve breakthrough we we we've seen walkouts we've seen negotiations we've seen compromise, we've seen all sorts of tactics. Do you think there's likely to be an, an evolu further evolution in the tactics of the Arab League or individual Arab states in attempting breakthrough? And, and what might that look like? I, I, I honestly cannot speak for the Arab League now. It's been three years away. I, I don't know what they are really uh, developing. Do they have the, uh, uh, the people inside who can affect the decisions of the Arab states themselves, because there is always this internal dynamic between the institution and the, uh, the member states. In my time, and I think you uh, both know this, we even developed an expert committee and an official committee that worked for 11 years to develop a draft treaty for the zone. But we didn't work on just a technical legal draft treaty. It was an opportunity to bring the Arab states to educate them on what does it mean to have such a zone? What does it entail of expertise? What, what are the limitations that are going to be put on them? And things like that. And we managed to do that, unfortunately, in 2006, 2007, I think, uh, the, the committee, again, out of frustration of the Arab states, was stopped, was frozen. But um, still, the text is there, the ideas are there. Some of the experts who participated there are, are now in, in a much higher position. So there is a better understanding of this. Yet, what the Arab League need to do is to develop a, a formula with the Arab states on how to approach the Iranians and the Israelis in serious negotiations. 
there are lessons learned from the past experiences and failures. And one of this is you cannot, again, be taken into what the Israelis call or what we call the long corridor, where you're taken for negotiations for a few years. And in the meantime, you are asked to give concessions. And then it ends for one reason or another, because the Israelis or the Iranians will turn to you and say, what are you talking about? This, the situation on the ground has changed. What we're talking about now doesn't work. And then you resume again after a couple of years from the uh, point where your concessions are taken for granted. And that creates also, again, the frustration among some of the Arab states. So what we need now is some sort of a serious discussion and negotiations and formal negotiations. These informal consultations and negotiations prove to be unwise and doesn't work. What we need to is to have seen. This will not happen unless there is a government in Israel that thinks this idea is worth investigating at least. I mean, if we start seriously discussing the idea of the zone, it will take us a few years to get there. It's not going to, to, to happen tomorrow, but they have to be serious about it. Unfortunately, I haven't seen that yet. In all their attempts in negotiations, and I have to be honest about this, my impression was that they are just there in the discussions to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. I can understand their fears. I can understand their worries, their threat perceptions, and their uh, slippery slope position, which basically means they cannot give you anything because it's a slippery slope. Negotiations doesn't work that, uh, that way. So unless there is a different government, uh, uh, when I am saying different, I don't mean another government, I mean different in their perspective of the region, not a right-wing government, that, uh, that would allow a serious discussion inside Israel first on nuclear issues and on cooperation with the Arab states, and then would be ready to open the doors for a discussion. What we're asking for is serious discussions and negotiations on where can we take this region when it comes to arms control issue. So I have a, a question that in a way is a double question. What do you think of the METOS approach in using a draft treaty text to, to focus on overcoming obstacles and find the common ground of what the states in the room can agree? Because in the UN conference on the zone, Israel is not participating. And it means that the states in the room can make some progress towards the zone without Israel in the room. Do you see this, this uh, approach of, of METO, overcoming obstacles, finding the common ground? Can you see them working in the November conference room? Well, I, I think what METO is doing is very important and, and, and very beneficial, especially at this uh, juncture in time. Because it is not, as you said, it is not uh, just a, a separate idea on its own. It complements also the work of the November conference. It complements the work of, that's happening in UNIDIR. There are a number of factors. What you're doing in NATO is developing a treaty to, that proves to everybody that a treaty could be reached. It is not an impossibility. Technically and politically, it is the will that is missing, official will by governments. But, but what, what you're doing is you're putting at the table a draft treaty, which was the intention of the Arab League also in, at an earlier stage, is to have some sort of a treaty that we can give them, you can give it to the parties in the region and say, okay, here is a treaty. Start a serious discussion on it. Change whatever you need to change. Do whatever you want to do. Put your fears and threat perceptions. But there is a text that makes sense. And it's very important to put the member states within a frame of a specific treaty. Otherwise, discussions can go on forever without being focused. Now you have given us something to focus on and to discuss, whether when it comes to the objectives, whether when it comes to the verification, whether when it comes to who is in and who is, is not in, in it, do we do it regionally or just um, um, by international treaties? 
so many things that we have been discussing separately. Now you have that in a frame of a legal text that should help the member states to, to focus their thinking and their discussions. Now, you have the November conference. Yes, Israel is not there. And I think it is one of the major blunders of, of, of Israel not to be there and to allow a conference at, in the UN to discuss the region and always to point out that Israel refuses to join. They have something to say, they better be in and say it there. For the first time, I think they made a mistake. Usually they think in this manner, let's get in, let's not leave them alone. And uh, otherwise we, they might end up with something we don't like. Unfortunately, there is a sense now in most Arab quarters that the Israelis are behaving when it comes to this. I am sorry to say it with a bit of arrogance. We don't need you. We don't care. We'll get what we want without being involved in that. METO and the November conference and the project of, uh, of UNIGIR, this triangle of activities, is essential. And I think at the heart of it lies the draft treaty you're, you're developing. Thank you very much, Wael. I have to say that if I had to describe one of my most optimistic moments in this field was sitting on a panel with you presenting uh, Draft Treaty 3. Thank you. <laughs> we had an Iranian, an Arab, and an Israeli with some excellent experts and Paul. And, and I think we all shared a very optimistic moment in front of a full room of optimistics. It's, it's all thanks to you because you brought us together to, to sit at the table. Then we, we can start discussion. So you're, you're the heart of the issue. So don't, don't lose faith in, in, in the idea. The idea is there and alive in spite of the fact that it hasn't moved into implementation. It's only alive because it is a very good idea. We don't have an alternative. So there's no better idea in the field in the last 40 years. How do we, do we resolve arms control issue? The Iranian complexity of their nuclear file will be solved in this endeavor. The Israeli nuclear issue will also be resolved if we create the zone. The Arabs who are trying now to look into what can they do will find a place within this treaty to work the differences when it comes to arms control. Trying to uh, compensate the nuclear capabilities in Iran and in Israel by buying uh, horrific amounts of weapons uh, by the Arabs will stop now if we can have a serious discussion. May I add one last thing? We need to look at the idea of, because this is from my experience, when, when there is a serious government in Israel that we sit, the Arabs, the Israelis, and the Iranians, without external powers, the role of the external powers, especially the US and, and the British, was very negative when it comes to uh, bringing us together. And there were times in Lyon and in Geneva where I sat with my counterpart, the Israelis, and we laughed at the way the external powers who are sitting at the table are intentionally or non-intentionally sabotaging the process. So there is a point of looking at the idea of sitting alone as regional players and looking at what's best for us without the interests of the, of, of, of the external powers. Thank you, Well, I've got one last very brief question, because uh, we're well over time and uh, it's fascinating. But um, we've got a new administration in Washington. We have elections tomorrow in Israel. Uh, we have the November conference process. With so much experience of setback and, and dashed expectations, uh, can you find any slivers of hope for the future? Oh, yes. Look, the one constant thing in life is change. So the current situation will not remain as is. Things will change. Might not tomorrow, but things will, will change. And I am hoping, not a lot, but I'm hoping that the new administration at least will create some sort of a balance in their approach to issues in the region. Something acceptable because 
the situation in the last 40 years was a little bit uh, chaotic and crazy, actually, and would put it to the countries of the region that they need to work together to resolve issues and try to not to take sides in a flagrant way. They have to take sides, I know, but not in a very flagrant way to allow us as parties in the region to sit together and, and, and discuss things. Change will come. I believe change is inevitable. But also we have to be careful because things might get much worse before it gets any better. I understand, Wael. Thank you so much for an excellent interview, as usual, as expected, and um, <clears throat> very much looking forward to future collaboration. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this. You can find us online at www.wmd-free.me, where you can subscribe to our newsletter, donate money, or volunteer to work with us. We're also on social media, on Twitter at WMDFreeME, and similarly on Facebook and Instagram. Previous versions of the podcast with fascinating interviews are also on SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube.